Hi, Dr. Dave here to look at the racking controversy from the Derby City Classic this year. First I'll look at some basic brake strategy and effects, then I'll show what Dennis and Shane were doing to be so effective. If you have seen clips from the video encyclopedia of 9-ball and 10-ball, you will know that I have my table trained to get a good rack with all balls touching every time. For more information, see Vent 1 and the Racking Resource page on my website. In 9-ball, many people prefer breaking from the side. With a tight rack, the wing ball goes in the corner. Notice how the wing ball goes a little below the center of the pocket on this table. This can vary some with conditions. Also notice throughout this video that the 9-ball does not move very much, if at all, unless it gets kissed, except when I purposely add gaps to the rack. With the right speed, it is fairly easy to not only make the wing ball, but also get a look at the one after the break. Any decent player will get out from here. With more power, the wing ball still goes, but it can become more difficult to control the cue ball and consistently get a look at the one after the break. Although, with a good hit, the right speed, and cooperating balls, it is possible to get a good look at the one in the top left corner. A much more reliable way to get a look at the one is to use softer speed. Now let's look at what happens with the side break at different cut angles. The wing ball does not go with a large cut angle break. A cut break tends to send the wing ball below the corner. One nice feature of a side break is that the wing ball goes over a very wide range of cut angles. Shane and Dennis were not breaking from the side like most pros at the Derby City Tournament. Before we look at why, let's first look at ball reactions when breaking from close to the center of the table, as an extreme comparison to the side break. With a good rack, the wing ball still goes. Notice how it goes into the heart of the pocket, which was not the case with the side break. Generally, with the cue ball closer to the center, a square hit sends the wing ball a little farther up table. Now let's look at non-square hits. If you cut the brake too much, the wing ball goes too low. Now let's look at back cuts. If you cut the brake too much on this side, the wing ball goes too high. Breaking from the center is generally not a good approach. Now let's look at what Shane and Dennis did at the Derby City Classic. As we will see, breaking between the side and center is a good approach for both pocketing the wing ball and getting a good and consistent look at the one after the break. Shane was breaking from about this direction, and Dennis was breaking from about this direction. I'll show results from several directions in this range, starting with the cue ball exactly between the side and center. From here, with a square hit, the wing ball goes into the heart of the pocket, and I get a good look at the one after the break. Here are two more examples.
That time, I used too much speed and didn't control the cue ball as well, so I didn't get a good look at the one. As with the side brake, this brake also pockets the wing ball over a fairly large range of cuts in both directions. Now let's look at a position closer to where Dennis was breaking from. With a square hit, it is easy to get a look at the one, although I do use a little more speed than I should on this break. Notice how the wing ball goes into the upper part of the pocket with a square hit from this cue ball direction. With a slight cut, the wing ball goes into the heart of the pocket, and with slower speed, it is very easy to consistently get a look at the one after the break. I hit that one a little too hard and pocketed the one, but because I am pattern racking the balls, which is illegal in tournament play, I got a good look at the two. For more information about pattern racking, see the resource page on my website. Even with an increasing cut angle, the wing ball still goes, although it becomes more difficult to control the cue ball N1. With the right cut and speed, it is fairly easy to get a look at the one in the side. That's a sweet layout with a good look at the one, and everything is spread fairly well at one end of the table. I'm salivating, are you? This might be my new favorite break. If you cut the brake too much, the wing ball will go lower and eventually miss the corner. When back cutting, the wing ball still goes, but the one ball direction is no longer favorable. Now let's look at some gap effects because some people were accusing Shane and Dennis of purposefully manipulating the rack to create intentional gaps, which would be illegal, unethical, and unprofessional. Again, I think it is wrong to make such claims and accusations unless there is clear and irrefutable proof. Obviously, from the results we just saw, all that is required to pocket the wing ball and get a good look at the one is a solid rack and a decent hit. Let's start by looking at the effect of a gap in a bad place for a side break. Because my table is trained, it is difficult to create gaps between the balls, so I've added a folded up piece of tissue between the 2 and 4 to create an artificial gap. Any gap in the 1-2-4 ball path forces the wing ball to go below the corner. The reason is the solid 1-3-9-6 path moves the 6 before the 4, allowing the 4 to go more forward. The same effect occurs from other cue ball positions, but the effect is less with the cue ball closer to the center. The wing ball actually goes, even with the gap, with the cue ball close to the center. Now, things will vary some based on the size of the gap and what other gaps might be present elsewhere. The gap size varied based on how much I smashed the tissue between the balls. From the Dennis cue ball position, with a larger and variable gap size, results are very inconsistent. However, when I made sure the gap was small, which I think Dennis and Shane were striving for with their careful racking, the wing ball went very consistently from this cue ball position, even with a wide variation in cut amount and type of hit.
So did Shane and Dennis cheat at the Derby City Classic by manipulating the rack? I think the clear answer is no. As shown in this video, cheating was not required to achieve their excellent results. Shane and Dennis were simply the most accurate and consistent with getting tight racks, hitting the cue ball squarely, pocketing the wing ball, controlling the cue ball, and getting a good look at the one after the break. Also, choosing to break closer to center with a square hit yielded better results than a side break, especially if there were any small, unavoidable gaps between the one ball and the wing ball. Shane and Dennis did not need to cheat. They were just smarter and better breakers than the other players. For detailed explanations and demonstrations dealing with all 9-ball and 10-ball break strategies and effects, including most of the information presented in this video, see Disc 1 of the Video Encyclopedia of 9-ball and 10-ball at drdavebilliards.com. FYI, links to all resources mentioned in this video can be found in the video description below.